Good evening. Thank you for joining me in this Bible study. As we continue in our series of lessons in which we had just started uh, last Sunday uh, evening, uh, we were considering life lessons from that of Joseph of the Old Testament. And so I would encourage you to go back to the book of Genesis as we continue in this series. Uh, Joseph, as we, as I mentioned, was past uh, Sunday evening. Uh, he truly was a spiritual giant of his time and has some very valuable lessons that we're going to continue to learn from. Joseph has uh, an enormous amount of, of uh, lessons that we can learn from. So I'd encourage you to, of course, get your Bibles as we'll be looking at the text here in just a moment and walking through that text together in this second part of this series and this lessons we learned from Joseph. Now, we started by considering some background uh, regarding Joseph's family, and, and I believe that we all agree <laughs> uh, that dysfunctional is not exactly the best uh, <laughs> Uh, descriptive word for that family. As we mentioned several things, uh, some disturbing things uh, of the family's history. Uh, we talked about the problem of favoritism that continued throughout generations, uh, the violent tendencies even, uh, murderous rampage and plundering that Jacob's own sons carried out uh, in Genesis 34 as we thought about the revenge against Hamor and Shechem and for their sister who was defiled by Shechem. Uh, and not only that, but there was the sexual morality as noted with Reuben in Genesis 35 with his father's concubine. So there was just a lot of history that we just kind of briefly went over and maybe on your uh, own time there as well outside of that uh, uh, specific lesson on Joseph that you were able to look at some of those passages there. But there was a lot going on in, in that family. And as we noted in the lesson, the favoritism continued with Jacob loving Joseph more than all his children. You notice that, of course, in Genesis 37 and verses 3 and 4, we noted last time. And, and due to, to such, Joseph's brothers, we, we noted, had really an intense hatred for Joseph, so much so that Joseph's brothers, they could not even speak with him peaceably. They just couldn't do it. They refused to do it. And so Joseph's brothers envied him for the dreams that Joseph told, uh, where Joseph was portrayed with prominence above the other brothers. And at the end of chapter 37, uh, we saw where Joseph had been sold into slavery by his own brothers. And, and really, it was, a, it was a sad note that we ended on last, uh, last lesson there, last study here, uh, of really what the ill effects of hatred and jealousy and favoritism can lead to. Joseph experienced what we have many times called a pit stop uh, before being sold into slavery. And we consider that although Joseph had really this unpleasant pit stop, uh, that Joseph would share with us to look up, to look up. And, and Joseph couldn't get out of the pit on his own might or strength. He was incapable of freeing him, his, 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 himself from slavery. And as we continue to observe together the life lessons uh, that come from a study of the life of Joseph, he didn't let that moment uh, define him for the rest of his life. And so we actually see this throughout Joseph's life. Uh, what he does and how he responds to the circumstances that that happen in his in his life. So uh, again, we're going to be looking at the next life lesson from Joseph in chapter 39 of Genesis. So get get uh, there to Genesis chapter 39 in your Bibles as we we'll walk through this account together in these verses. Now, Joseph, as I mentioned, he really teaches us valuable lessons that are still applicable to our lives today. Uh, when we think about Joseph being sold into slavery at the at the, really the tender age of 17, uh, and in Genesis chapter 41 and verse 46, Joseph finally stood before Pharaoh, it says at the age of 30 years. He was 30 years old when he was finally able uh, to stand before Pharaoh. So, is approximated that in this particular chapter that we'll be considering in our study this evening, 
that Joseph would have been somewhere in his mid-twenties by, by this particular point. Now, this life lesson that we find in this chapter uh, has to do with temptation and how Joseph deals with temptation. And one of the things that we find in, in this chapter uh, that Joseph teaches us is to always be vigilant. Always be vigilant. And referring to my introductory remarks, I want you to imagine uh, as we see all that Joseph has been through and, and in coming into this situation we're going to be talking about uh, with Potiphar's wife, just imagine you are in Joseph's family and you had been treated the way that you have been by your siblings, uh, hated, uh, envied, um, to the point of being well, cast into a pit and then sold into slavery. I mean, the question is, would you be bitter about it? And I, I, I believe that uh, we, you know, sometimes uh, say, well, no, I, I wouldn't be bitter. I, I would have done just as Joseph had done. And that's not really being honest, <laughs> okay? Because things that are not uh, as... Uh, huge, I would say, in this particular instance in our lives, some of the smaller things, and let me know, let me, let me just tell you that, that we become bitter, don't we? We, we, we become uh, uh, holding grudges and all kinds of things. Um, but I think I, I would have had some problems with how uh, I was so wrongly treated if I was in uh, Joseph's shoes. And Joseph had his ups and downs, uh, obviously, going from the favorite son with, with in donning his nice coat of many colors that was handmade by his father, just living day by day to be thrown into a pit and sold into slavery, taken to a foreign place. Um, you know, and, and I mentioned that uh, Joseph didn't allow those circumstances to define him nor the rest of his life. He didn't allow that to happen. And we find that to be the truth here in our study even this, this evening that Joseph did well even in this foreign land due to his outlook, his perspective here, his outlook on things. The circumstances didn't alter his outlook. Because of such, we find that Joseph is, is found to have gone from the pit really to a prominent position in Potiphar's house. So Joseph was sold by the Ishmaelites to, uh, uh, to an uh, Egyptian by the name of uh, Potiphar, as you see in chapter 39 and verse 1. Again, we're walking through this text together. And Potiphar is, is noted as being uh, an officer of Pharaoh, uh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian. And, and again, he purchased uh, Joseph from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. Now, we have to keep in mind that this would have been very different than what Joseph would be used to. Uh, this was more than just a change in his day-to-day -day routines. Uh, he would be surrounded by those who spoke a different language. Uh, it's obviously going to be a much different culture than what he has uh, been accustomed to. Uh, so in spite of all of that, though, I, I think it's interesting that as we read on in verses 2 through 5, that it says, the Lord was with Joseph, and he was what? A successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian, and his master saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house and all that he had put under his authority. So it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake, and the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. So what we see from those few verses there is that Joseph was thriving. He was thriving. And Joseph was a diligent laborer. He exemplified a faithful steward even uh, of what he had been entrusted uh, with from his master, Potiphar. And Potiphar even recognized that the success of Joseph was because of what? The Lord was with him. You see that in verse 3. The Lord was with him. So Joseph was excelling here, okay? Joseph was excel excelling. 
Potiphar acknowledged that this that this is really from God. Uh, what was happening here? Joseph was excelling so much so that if you note, even in chat and in, in verse six, even in verse six, I want you to notice what it says that Potiphar left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Joseph had complete control over everything except for the food, which we'll mention more about the food issue later. That, that comes later. But this would be a very honorable position uh, to be in, and it carried with it some great responsibility. We find that Joseph continues to prosper, and he continues to do well, although he is far from his familiar surroundings and those things he's accustomed to, and maybe not exactly uh, the type of circumstance he thought he would have been in <laughs> at this uh, point in his life. But again, uh, I, I thought about Joseph and all the plans uh, he may have had for his life as he grew older. Uh, as, as we have done in our lives, we would chart out our plan at an early age and outlining where we are and where we will see ourselves, you know, uh, who, who we will be with, uh, what kind of work we plan on doing, you know, all of those things that we try to chart out early in our life. And, and I don't think Joseph had this very instant outlined uh, in his mind years earlier. At least, I mean, I know I wouldn't have. This, this is not something we would actually have jotted down saying we would have been in this particular situation. But I would say that Joseph is working the situation <laughs> quite wonderfully. Uh, and the Lord, of course, was, was working uh, with Joseph there. Uh, now, now, with all of his achievements and all that he was doing and excelling, uh, there's something else to be noted in the latter part of verse 6, in which I underlined there in green. It says, Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Now, it's not too often that we find the physical traits being mentioned um, in the Bible, although there are a few that we do read and, and, and are recorded for us. And this is one of them that speaks of Joseph. Really, he's, he's, he's a handsome fella. <laughs> he's handsome in form, uh, meaning that, that basically he was well built, uh, as, as well as being handsome in appearance, which would mean, well, he, he looked good. That's, that's, that's pretty much what he's saying there. So I want us to think about this. Uh, how many today who are in positions of power and uh, handsome to boot uh, in form and appearance, find temptation just lurking at the door. Joseph found himself in the same predicament. Here we see a man who is handsome, he's young, vibrant, excelling in his work, he's trustworthy, he's away from his family, and additionally, he's in a home where uh, of a woman whose husband is possibly gone tending the matters of Pharaoh. I mean, I mean, when we look at that and we kind of get the picture in our minds, do you see the storm brewing uh, in this in this situation? I think we see. I see. I think we see that, don't we? And this is what I think Joseph would tell us, though, as we think about life lessons. Uh, but although it is apparent that Joseph was looking up, as mentioned uh, before, he also needed to look out. <laughs> Look up, but also look out for what potential temptations lurk around the corners. Joseph is saying, always be vigilant, be aware, and that even Peter would remind us in 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. I thought about even uh, Cain when God told Cain in Genesis 4 and verse 7, uh, if you do not do well, he said, sin lies at the door. Sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. And I think those words truly echo uh, today that we are uh, to realize that sin lies at the door that its desire is for us, but we should rule over it. We should never allow ourselves to become complacent, but always readily aware of what is lurking all around us. It's all around us, 
And Joseph found himself in a very, very difficult situation. We need to always be vigilant. So, so that's one of the things that we, we definitely take away as, as we're walking through this text. But as we continue in our text, I think that Joseph would even teach us in what we're about to see is that we need to recognize uh, sin for what it is. Recognize sin for what it really is. When you go to verse 7, I want you to notice there what's, what's, what's stated. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. Now we can look at this and say all the reasons this is wrong. You know, Joseph is obviously loyal to his master Potiphar, and by lying with his master's wife would have been wrong. It would have been sinning against his master Potiphar. And with such, his trustworthy character uh, would be marred with his master. And, and we might ask the question here, was that the overall factor in Joseph's thought processes? Well, look at verses 8 and 9. Verses 8 and 9. But he, talking about Joseph, refused and said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. Verse 9, There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. Look at this. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Now Joseph does mention... Uh, of all that, that his master Potiphar has entrusted to his hand and that Potiphar hasn't kept anything back from him except for her, Potiphar's wife. But Joseph further acknowledged openly that this would be great wickedness. I mean, look, look the way that he defines this situation. He says, this is great wickedness. And the prevailing factor here was much more than just wronging Potiphar, his master. Joseph says that this would be wrong because it would have been a sin against God himself. Look at that again, underlined in green. I put it, how then could I do this great evil, this great wickedness and sin against God? And so Joseph basically is refusing her advances, refusing her request to lie with her. Joseph provides us with such an outstanding example. He recognized sin for what it really is and knew that such would be sinning against God. That was his chief concern. That was his chief concern. Not what if somebody finds out. What if it, He was concerned about his relationship with God. Now, if we could always have that mentality, no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, that prevailing thought by recognizing sin for what it really is and ask the same question that Joseph did, how then could I do this great wickedness and sin against God? If I have that on my mind, if I have that on my mind, then I will make the right decision to abstain from such wickedness so my relationship with God will be unaffected as well as my relationship with my spouse, my children, my career, and, and so on. Again, do we today recognize sin for what it really is and the consequences that it brings into our lives if we engage in it? Again, that's another great life lesson right here in this, in this chapter. Always be vigilant. There's sin lurking all around. There's opportunities that's presenting itself for us to stumble and to fall. We need to recognize what sin really is. Staying, not just looking up, but looking out. Joseph is showing us how to do that. He is showing us. But, but even that, that, that Joseph shows here, that, that, that yes, she has, is, is advancing him, that she's making her request, casting those longing eyes on Joseph. 
But I want you to notice that as we continue in our text that Joseph's diligence in guarding from yielding to this temptation, he is so diligent here that it is quite uh, amazing. And I believe that this is commendable of Joseph to have made his attempts to get Potiphar's wife to understand his strong position as to why he would not do this great wickedness. I mean, he tries to reason with Potiphar's wife. Uh, and I see him explaining it uh, as we read together there in verses uh, 8 and 9 of our text. But Potiphar's wife... You know, she just doesn't like the idea of being told no. <laughs> she doesn't care for that. And so when you notice there in verse 10, so it was as she spoke to Joseph day by day. Notice that. Day by day that he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. So as she spoke to Joseph day after day, what was Joseph's response to such? He did not heed her. He didn't pay attention to her persistency. Now, she's persistent, obviously, and she's just looking to wear him down is basically what that was, was what's being stated there by her persistence. And I thought about the difficult situation this must have been for Joseph. I mean, he had to carry on uh, his work from day to day, and, of course, she would persistently pursue after him, but he would make really his best attempts to distance himself from such. You know, friends, we, we need to be aware of this even today. Uh, sometimes we don't, don't uh, realize it, but we mentioned that there are a whole host of temptations, temptations, sin that is lying at the door, and we don't need to see how close we can get before we cross the line. We need to see how we, we need to distance ourselves we need to distance ourselves. I've talked with folks who struggle with temptations and readily, readily admitted that they played with the fire and in turn got burned. You know, sin took them further than they wanted to go and they paid the consequences for it. Whatever it is that is a temptation, distance yourself from it. Recognize what sin is. Be vigilant. Be sober. Recognize the devil is walking about lurking. Sin lies at the door. Distance yourself from it. If someone is tempted by that of alcohol, it would be quite helpful if they distance themselves from, uh, let's say, a bar or from those who engage in such activities of consuming alcohol. If one is weak in the flesh and tempted towards sexual morality, well, I would submit to you not to go to places that flaunt the flesh openly. Uh, and, and again, there's temptation uh, of sin all around us, but we shouldn't go dabbling around with it. Again, we're not trying to see how close we can get before we cross the line. That's, we need to see how far we can get away from it. We wouldn't play around with an active bomb, would we? <laughs> of course not, because it's dangerous, and we realize that it has dangerous and disastrous effects. So does sin, except it has eternal consequences, eternal consequences. I want you to notice verse 11 and 12 now. But it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house was inside that she caught him by his garment saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. So Potiphar's wife in her persistent pursuit, realizing that her attempts have been futile thus far, she planned to wait until her and Joseph would be alone. This time, the scripture says that she caught him by his garment. And to get away, Joseph fled, and he left his garment uh, in her hands. Now, I would just make a side note that I think it is safe to say that Joseph had a problem in keeping up with his coats or garments. <laughs> I mean, this would, be at, this would turn out to be the second time that his clothing would be used to uh, disseminate a lie about Joseph, as we'll see. 
Paul would tell, would remind Timothy about fleeing. As we think about this fleeing, flee also youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. What a great reminder that we find in Joseph's life as to what he's doing, that he was truly fleeing to get away from that uh, temptation. And we are to do the same thing today. This encounter with Potiphar's wife, you notice, had increased from uh, just verbal pleas uh, to this point of her physically catching him by the garment. And, and again, Joseph fled. He fled that situation. And, and one has put it this way, when you flee from temptation, do not leave a forwarding address. <laughs> I think that's uh, very, very uh, safe to say, we, or very wise words there. When you flee from temptation, do not leave a forwarding address. I, I, I really, really like that. We have to have the same type of diligence that Joseph had here. Get away from it. We cannot become complacent. We cannot be worn down by the persistent things around us. You know, uh, Back in 2018, there was a, a news report about an incident that occurred uh, in January of 2018 in, in Montecito, California. The report advised that there were, se that were, there were severe rainstorms that uh, would hit the area hard, and there were warnings that were, that were given in the call for evacuations. And although many were warned, and some even uh, packed a, what we'd call a go bag, uh, but ignored the warning. They, they, they didn't see the urgency uh, or the rainstorm as being as dangerous as reported. Those who live in that area are warned really over and over and over again in regards to fires and floods and earthquakes. And, and it has been said that what is called evac evacuation fatigue calls some to ignore the peril of the mudslides that claimed the lives of 17 people, ages ranging from 3 to 89. Survivors of this incident, although escaping death, sustained injuries and admitted that although there have been many calls for caution, being prepared, and even evacuations, some of which have never came to be, well, they doubted as to whether this particular time would be as bad as the authorities said. That's a very sad situation. I mean, look at this. 17 people died, ages 3 to 89. Spiritually, we must never become fatigued to the point where we are dull of hearing, even as the Hebrew writer talks about the warnings. And on that one day, like those in Montecito, California, decide not to flee when it was absolutely necessary that we did so. I ask simply how diligent, we, how diligent are we today? Are we ever diligent like that of Joseph who, who guarded against yielding to temptation because he was ready, prepared at any given moment, not to just think about fleeing, but actually fleeing. He was ready. He was ready. And we need to realize as well for us today that we need to be vigilant, recognize again what sin really is, and be ready to flee from it. Last but, not, but certainly not least of our study and discussion this, this evening, we must also note something else from our text that I want us to, to note and, and, and another great life lesson that we see here in this chapter. And that is to be careful not to become disillusioned. But you notice there in verses 16 down through verse 20, read with me there. So she kept his garment, Potiphar's wife there, kept his garment with her until his master came home. 
Then she spoke to him with words like these, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you brought to us came in to me to mock me. So it happened as I lifted my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and fled outside. So it was when his master heard the words which his wife spoke to him, saying, Your servant did to me after this manner, that his anger was aroused. Then Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the prison. Now, based on what we see there, I think it is quite easy to become disillusioned when things don't turn out the way that we thought they should have turned out. You know, when things don't go according to plan in our minds. For doing good, for doing the right thing, surely there's got to be a reward for doing the right thing, right? That's not the way it is, though. It's not the way it is. Since Joseph would not lie with Potiphar's wife, well, Potiphar's wife would lie on him to her husband. We know that Potiphar's wife was lying. We know that. We know that Joseph did not do what he was falsely accused of doing. Potiphar's wife would even amp up the emotions. Oh, the emotions. Hear that just when you read that, uh, you know, of her husband Potiphar by saying to him, the Hebrew servant whom you brought, whom you brought to us, verse 17 says. And then she tells him that you brought him into our house and now you just look what happened look what happened and basically you know it's all your fault it's all your fault Potiphar now Potiphar's reaction based on the information that he had was understandable I believe I mean the text says that Potiphar's anger was aroused verse 19 it's it's interesting and and surprising that being in the position that he was as captain of the guard of Pharaoh he could have just really executed Joseph he could have executed him. It was, it's been speculated that since Joseph had impressed Potiphar during uh, the considerable time that he had uh, been in Potiphar's service, that it is possible that uh, Potiphar uh, didn't fully believe the accusations that his wife gave against Joseph, but, you know, that's speculation. So, so Potiphar decides to confine Joseph into prison. So as you look at this, Joseph went from the pit to a prominent position and now to the prison. What a roller coaster ride, right? It's a truth that we can do all the good and we can do all the right things and, and just and the just things. We can do that. And we can suffer for doing so too. We can suffer. Joseph shows us this life lesson as he experienced it. It was not Joseph who experienced such. Uh, um, not only him, but, but Jesus. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, did as well. I mean, Jesus had false accusations against him. Jesus was uh, certainly persecuted. He had done no wrong. And we must allow the Word of God to remind us today that in our society, fleeing temptation is not something that is notable and significant in the eyes of men. But it is in. It is notable and it is significant in the eyes of the one who really matters, God. Notice in the last few verses of our text, verses 21 through 23. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy, and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. The Lord was with him and whatever he did, the Lord made to prosper. Although Joseph was confined in that uh, prison, the Lord was with him. More on that will be forthcoming in this series of lessons, Lord's willing. But as we conclude our thoughts uh, this evening, just having looked at chapter 39 of Genesis, I hope we have received some encouragement from God's words. I hope that we have seen the life lessons that Joseph is teaching us here. 
you know, and, and I even thought that uh, in that of temptation, as we were talking about, it's, you, you think about what uh, Paul said to the Corinthian brethren in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verses 12 and 13. Notice, notice what, what it says there, and I hope you're proving all things according to God's word and not just mine. God's word says, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. What a great reminder we have there, even from the Apostle Paul in Corinthians. God provided a way of escape for Joseph, and Joseph made the exit in haste. May we have the courage, the courage that Joseph had. There are so many temptations, so many things that, that, that are out there, again, lurking, that, that exist out there in the world. It's all around us, as I mentioned earlier. And I just hope that we are learning from what we see here in Joseph, that we, that we really all, that we're always vigilant, that we're always sober, that we're always, uh, that we always realize, as Peter said, that um, the, the devil is, is lurking, that he's walking about to and fro, just like a lion seeking whom he may devour. Again, th that's, you know, that's, that's pretty intense there. When you get that imagery in your minds, and Joseph Joseph realized this. He saw this. He recognized what sin really is. He didn't play around with it. He didn't play around with it. He had his guard up. He was vigilant. And we realize that even if one has fallen or struggling with persistent temptations in life, there's a way out. You don't have to stay in it. You can get out. You just have to make that exit. Realize that God is providing that way. As we even know of 1 John 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness through His Son's blood. What great lessons. What great lessons from the life of Joseph. Just some, some, some simple lessons that we really take from Genesis 39. I mean, they kind of jump out of the... They jump out of the out of the pages there from these verses at us. And I say simple lessons, but they're really they're really hard though. They're very difficult when we think about application. And it's easy to look at Joseph and say we wouldn't be bitter and you know we, we would we would be able would do the same thing, but you know, take a step back and look. Think how difficult all of this was in Joseph's life. But look how he responds to the circumstances each and every time. So far in Genesis 37, Genesis 39, Joseph is excelling. Doing the right thing, however, now he's in prison. But again, he's still looking up and looking out. What great lessons. What great lessons to learn from. I hope that this lesson has been encouraging to you as it has been for me in studying it and presenting it here in this Bible study. I hope that you have searched those scriptures with me. And again, there's so much rich application here. Let's make sure to apply that to our lives. Apply it to your life as I apply it to mine. It's very, very important and very significant because again, it has eternal consequences. And we want to make sure that we're always vigilant. We're always recognizing sin, what sin really is. And that we are always diligent, always be diligent in our efforts to live right before God. And don't become disillusioned even when things don't go according to plan. Because we know not everything happens according to plan, does it? Joseph learns this very, very, very hard. The very difficult way he's learning. He sees it. But again, keep looking up and looking out. Keep holding to the faith. Keep holding fast. Keep moving onward, upward, forward. Stay tuned as we will be looking at another lesson from the life of Joseph. Part 3 will be coming next Sunday evening, Lord's willing. So please uh, come back here for that continued study and for more life lessons from Joseph, such a great spiritual giant of his time.
great lessons we learn. All right, for this Bible study, this is all I have for today. Thank you again for joining me and, and uh, hope that you have a wonderful, wonderful day and God bless.